Hi, we're going to start Chapter 2 with an introduction to motion. This is the first of three videos that will cover um, velocity in Chapter 2. First, I'd like us to talk about motion diagrams. They're a, a way to graphically, visually show motion. Um, rather than click on that link, I have it open in my browser. A motion diagram is typically just a series of dots. These are boxes. Uh, they can be dots or boxes or circles. Um, and the distance between them indicates something about the velocity of the object. Think of it as like a strobe photograph where the time difference between each dot is the same. This would be a picture of constant motion moving to the right. Each dot is spaced equally. And if they're spaced equally in distance as well as in time, then that tells us that the velocity is constant. Remember, every dot happens the same length of time after the one before it. So the time between each of these dots is the same. So if the time and the distance are the same, then you have a constant velocity. Constant velocity moving to the left. Again, the dots are equally spaced. This time just moving to the left. So let's look at these arrows above. These arrows indicate velocity, and that's what this little V over here stands for, is velocity. So when it was moving to the right, the velocity vectors were to the right. And now that it's moving to the left, the velocity vectors are to the left. Notice each of the vectors are the same length. That means the velocity is staying constant in time. A simple way, if I were just doing one by hand, I would do dots to show constant velocity. I would put the dots the same length, uh, the same distance apart. And I generally make my arrows to go from one dot to the other. So not only is it proportional to the distance, it is the distance. So you can see the arrows stay the same size, the velocity stays the same size. I can pull that browser window back up. If we're speeding up to the right, notice the dots get farther apart. Greater distances in the same time would indicate that the, it was going faster and faster, the velocity is getting bigger. Look at the velocity uh, vectors, little, bigger, 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 and this one it would be even bigger, representing the, the speed uh, in that last interval. Um, now that the uh, speed isn't constant, we actually have an acceleration. Uh, we haven't talked about acceleration yet, and this kind of comes in chapter three, um, but acceleration is, is how fast the velocity is changing. So a really big acceleration would mean you're speeding up really fast, and a small acceleration would mean you're speeding up slowly. This is the acceleration vector. It represents how much faster uh, the object is moving as it's moving along. We won't be doing acceleration vectors yet, but they'll come, and so it's worth noting how you draw them. Slowing down to the right, as you would expect, if it's slowing down, the dots get closer together, and the velocity vectors get shorter and shorter. Um, starting from rest, these would be really close together and coming to a stop. The last ones are really close together. Okay, so motion diagrams are just a way to represent really, really simply the motion of an object. It is understood that the same amount of time passes between each of your dots. So that if the dots are far apart, you know the velocity is high. If the dots are close together, you know the velocity is low. We draw the velocity vector over the dots. The velocity vector, the length of the arrow, represents how fast it's going. So when this one's slowing down, the arrows get smaller and smaller. Notice here the acceleration vector points to the left. If the object is slowing down, then the acceleration is opposite to the direction of the motion. So a velocity to the right slowing down would give us a, an acceleration to the left. Vector quantities and scalar quantities. Um, velocity and displacement are both examples of vector quantities. Remember, vector quantities have magnitude. That's just size and direction. So velocity and displacement both have not only a magnitude, how fast or how far, but they have a direction. Now, in the problems that we do, which are one-dimensional for right now, 
the direction is only one dimensional, so up and down, or left and right, or uh, forward and backward, north and south. So often the direction is given with just a plus sign or a minus sign, although it could be north or south or left or right. Um, but it's, it's simple to show those with a plus or a minus sign. Um, scalar quantities are magnitude only. So where a velocity would tell you how fast and in what direction, speed would simply tell you how fast. Distance would simply tell you how far. So your displacement during the day, if you get out of bed in the morning and you get in your car and you come to school and you walk around the school and then you get back in your car and you go home, your displacement during the day could be zero because it is um, the displacement is your final position can say that's df minus your initial position. And if your final and initial positions are the same, then your displacement zero. The distance that you've traveled during the day would not be equal to zero because distance doesn't have a direction. And so all of that displacement that you make from your home to the school cancels with the displacement that you make going from the school back to your home because the dis the directions are opposite. But with distance, it's all positive. Just like with speed, it's all positive. And so distance is simply how far without a direction attached to it. Speed is how fast without a direction. Distance is how far without a direction. Velocity and displacement have uh, direction as part of their description. Now occasionally we will use velocity and speed interchangeably. Uh, that's possibly when the direction of the velocity is positive and um, there aren't two directions, it doesn't turn around and go back the other way, so all the velocities have the same direction, then velocity and speed would be equivalent. So time interval and displacement. We already talked about displacement on the previous slide, and I said displacement is equal to the final position minus the initial position. Now a shorthand way to write this, and you'll see this often, is using the Greek letter delta D. The Greek letter delta in science means change in. And it is always the final value minus the initial value. So a shorthand way to write it would be delta D. Delta D represents final distance or position minus initial position. For time interval, it works the same. A time interval is represented by delta T, and that's equal to the final time minus the initial time. Now you'll see when I solve problems for you in class or when I help you with your homework that I will often instead of putting delta T I'll just say T. The thing is for almost every problem that you'll ever work the initial time, the time that you would start your stopwatch at the beginning of a problem is almost always going to be zero. And so our time interval is from some zero time to some final, final time. So instead of writing delta t, it's pretty safe just to write t. t doesn't mean 3 o'clock or 3.30 or 7. It's not a time on the clock. It is the time that has passed since the stopwatch was started at the beginning of the problem. And since the stopwatch starts at zero, that time is our time interval. So be okay when I write an equation and, and just use a T instead of a delta T, your book will exclusively use delta T for time intervals, but you will see me just use T. And it's not just that I'm slack and sloppy. Um, there's a legitimate reason why it's okay to drop that delta and just say T. So delta means change in, always means final value minus initial value. So if you're increasing, your change in will be positive. If you're decreasing, that means your final value is less, then your delta value, the change in value, will be a negative. And that finishes up the first part of chapter 2.